Our first speaker is uh, Jared Roberts. Uh, he's the uh, technology principal and managing partner of the Incredible Pair. And he, Jared's going to be talking about his work with PBS. And um, he's known as the Renaissance Man. And you'll see why. All right. uh -oh. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeremy Roberts. And uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about preparing kids to succeed in school and life and uh, share a long-term vision for what PBS Kids thinks about uh, constructing ecosystems to serve all children. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our view of the role of uh, engagement in learning outcomes. And next, I'll tell you about our philosophy uh, that any time is learning time and uh, how PBS Kids wants to be everywhere that a kid uh, might be. Then I'll talk about our strategies to try to make the content that we think kids need most and how we want to meet each kid on their particular journey and help them along it. Uh, and finally, I'll share some thoughts on the power of good tooling. So the role of engagement. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the role of engagement. I'm going to use some uh, wacky formulas here. Um, and uh, yeah, so learning is inside, it's outside, it's digital, it's analog, it's sometimes alone, sometimes with others. There's a lot of things that go into learning. But one of the things that we really take to heart at PBS Kids is how it's multiplied by that engagement factor, the big blue E. And if the engagement factor goes to zero, then so does the learning, uh, the L. Um, and so, uh, you know, that leads me to a second point. With a slight modification, I can make this much better. Uh, that is now kid dependent. That engagement factor is specific to each individual kid. Uh, and so I think we can serve kids better uh, the more we know about them as individuals. And uh, in early usability and appeal testing, uh, for example, I'll, I'll share one anecdote where a boy who accidentally got three pieces of content from Peg Plus Cat in a row, declared that he hated Peg, uh, Peg Plus Cat, and he, made, he just bailed on testing, and he made a beeline for the bear in the corner and gave it a big hug. And uh, so I think much like favored characters and disfavored characters, there are many other factors uh, that are kid dependent. And uh, you know, listening to Sasha talk yesterday at, uh, at lunch, I just think that they're not just baked into the product, but also into the community and the larger systems involved here. So PBS really wants to be where the kid is. And I'm going to breeze through this, because I want to make sure I, I stick to my time limit. Um, so 77% of kids, two to eight, watch PBS Kids every month uh, on television. 8.2 million kids on the website. Uh, 500 games or so are up on the library there. 411 million streams of video across all platforms per month. And that's Fire TV, Android, Apple TV, Google, Xbox One, lots of different platforms going on there. And 4.2 billion streams uh, since j between June and March uh, of this year. So that's just amazing to me, 4.2 billion streams. Um, and a brief sideline here, I don't think I really can offer any general advice on how to achieve that kind of reach. I think it derives from the power of television. Uh, but I wonder if uh, you know, the right thought isn't more along the lines of how could PBS Kids and public media who has access to, to a resource like this and the power of television and the reach, how could we use that rare resource to help support this community of practice and the work that's being done in, in these fields? But no promises. Interactive whiteboard, uh, just to help with some of the classroom use cases. Um, we have uh, something we call PBS Learning Media. It's a service for teachers so they can find and curate uh, uh, material, uh, supplemental material, standards correlated material for use in the classroom. Community engagement out in the real world. Um, these are great. They're events uh, that are designed by PBS member stations and conducted by PBS member stations and their partners. And they bring uh, characters, internet, devices, um, content, uh, and mediation all together into these events. And the models are then uh, perfected and shared out and scaled up. And our focus is traditionally on the underserved communities. So uh, this particular picture is from KBTC in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, and if anyone wants to hear more stories about this, I, I, got, I got tons. It's awesome. Um, PBS uh, Parents Play and Learn, there's some, a couple apps for parents that we also throw into the mix. Uh, we know kids are often with their parents and caregivers. And uh, Play and Learn, which is available now for free in the app stores, uh, is, uh, provides uh, more than a dozen games that parents can play with their kids, each themed around a familiar location. So garden, grocery store, uh, restaurant, kitchen, many more places, things like that. And it's great because it connects parents and kids around things that are fun, you know, and around curiosity and around learning and the media content. And it does it all in familiar places. Too them. So anytime is learning time. 
Supervision, this is another app that we have for parents. Um, it's uh, worthy of note. It's uh, also available currently for free in the app stores. And it uh, offers a real-time connection between parents and their kids' activity and, and on PBS contents. So you, you sync it with the PBSKids.org website and soon with uh, mobile apps that we, uh, that we have. And you get an activity stream of what your child is doing and information about the pieces of content and what the learning goals are and uh, a set of feature updates that we're testing right now with WestEd in a home study uh, adds the ability to see performance related uh, information as well. So useful levels of summary around that. I'm talking things like uh, all time best activity, recent activity, trend uh, analysis and, and things of this nature uh, accompanied with recommendations for the parent about how they could engage with their uh, kid around the media and wh what might be happening, what, what should they do next maybe. Um, one of the first products that we'll launch that will be powering uh, those reports for parents is the uh, Measurement Skill Pack. That's a working title. It's a tablet app. It's for preschoolers. It focuses on measurement content. Uh, I think it's uh, for three to five year olds. And uh, it thoughtfully sequences games and videos and assessment and reward systems into adventures uh, that the kids play. And uh, you know, we think that the uh, that it's uh, absolutely beautiful, um, by the way, the engagement factors. U usability and appeal testing is go going great with this. Um, I've had kids uh, engage with this particular app for hours and hours straight, be forced to put it away and pull it back out, and then engage with it again for another hour. So, I, so I've been really pleased with uh, how this is going. Um, but a, a quick look under the hood here, because I think it's useful, the sequencing, um, the games sometimes are exposure and modeling problem solving. Sometimes they're decision making related. The video almost always exposes you to a concept and provides role models for how to work through uh, challenges. Um, videos, uh, open-ended play experiences, things that model cause and effect on skill, but there is no right and wrong. Uh, and then things that are much more of a challenge, things that are more assessment oriented as well are baked in. And all of it, uh, we have tried to thoughtfully put together in a way that we think is gonna move kids more effectively through this material. Um, it's also interesting to note that these games are repurposed. They are standalone capable and aggregation capable. I'm pulling them in, into this app uh, this, from the same source that might be powering them being available on our website as well. So I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, when I get into distribution platforms and multi-platform publishing and tooling, but just wanted to hint at that. Okay, this is more fun. Have what the kids need. All right, so that was be where the kid is. Now, what do the kids need? And how do we go about making what they need? And how do we know if it's what the kids need? And uh, I'm just gonna talk about a few strategies that we use. Uh, first off, learning frameworks. We, uh, we like to use a common ontology. Uh, they're typically hierarchical and they allow us to have consistent mappings of all the content in a vast library. Maybe 100 plus products will all be consistently mapped to this uh, learning framework. They're multi-tiered, um, they're hierarchical. This is a math example. It's, it's uh, aligned to the uh, Common Core State Standards for Mathematics and despite the simplified visual representation, there's a lot of granular information in these learning frameworks, including behavioral expressions of expert level behavior, uh, so that we can inform our content developers and our uh, producers uh, when they design uh, learning experiences and also uh, provide that information to our assessment designers. They also include big ideas, um, learning progressions, uh, and habits of mind so that our uh, producers can keep that uh, in mind as they develop. Uh, formative research, we do paper testing, we do us usab uh, usability and appeal testing, we do A-B testing, and we do uh, other sorts of more informal things through relationships that we have with the schools, also very useful. Um, and these, this huge content library with this uh, unified strategy behind it with respect to learning goals. It's the execution of all that planning embodied in a learning framework. And uh, we leverage our extended producer community in order to, uh, uh, and our deep IP bench to, to achieve breadth. And where needed, we try to go for depth on individual uh, pieces of content on, on a case by case basis. But everything is commissioned intentionally and specifically uh, to fill uh, up a spot in the, the learning framework. Um, and in a, a previous round of the Ready to Learn grant through the U.S. Department of Education, we produced two new television programs, uh, 100 plus apps, 100 plus offline activities, and so much more stuff, including all the parent uh, material I mentioned before. All right, uh, feature analysis. This is relatively new for us, but it's starting to look like it might be really important. Um, there's some great work we've looked at lately. Uh, turns out, you know, feature, uh, good feature analysis of assessment items can be a good predictor of difficulty level. And that's super neat, so we're saying why don't we try to, at PBS Kids to apply a similar approach to our content offerings, to our games as well. 
um, and keep track of them over time, uh, build a learner profile, do the feature analysis of, uh, on the learner profiles to explore what different measures and combinations of measures will re reliably predict what. Um, yeah. And uh, we already have the pieces in place to get the data sets we need uh, to refine the predictors and detectors, which leads me to the idea that PBS Kids uh, might be an interesting experimental platform uh, for this community of practice. Imagine a world where a game that's uh, undergone the feature coding is played by a bunch of kids at PBS Kids and a very high quality anonymized logging data is centrally stored and accessible to those who uh, wish to access it, which we, we have that in place now. And also that the games um, that the kids play, they, they've also uh, been developed along with a custom set of uh, interactive assessments that, that's uh, related to that library of content. Um, and those assessments have also uh, undergone feature coding. And could we propose and refine uh, game analytics algorithms in a superstructure like this? Could we get super cheap scale in doing so? Could we open up the ability to look into those questions more broadly? I mean, I, I know um, people have been competing variations of uh, game and, and instruction strategies for ages, and more and more uh, people are being able to do it in an automated fashion, and there are a lot of people in this room who, who do that. Um, but how many people are outside of this room who would love to have access to uh, that kind of capability? And what if, you, uh, what if you built the ability to configure the experiment into the distribution platform, you know, and the ability to administer assessment into the distribution platform, and the command and control capabilities to run that kind of experiment into the distribution platform? So I'm talking about building an admin where you define a sampling strategy and an N for the number of play sessions that you want, and a, a, a control game a configuration variation, and any number of treatment game configuration variations, and uh, define the appropriate assessments uh, that are related to your motivation questions and then launch the experiment and have all the deployment and tagging and, uh, and data handling and everything uh, taken care of under the hood. Uh, so couldn't we run RCTs at super low cost uh, in very short periods of time with a system like that? And uh, could we uh, get a valuable supplement to our existing research efforts by doing so? I think so. Um, we might be able to predict performance from one game level to the next. Uh, one skill cluster to the next, one uh, sequence of historical activity across a library to uh, performance on standardized assessments, maybe from that, that sequence of activity to major life milestones. I mean, I heard things here in this conference today that make me think that these kinds of things are already happening for small numbers of kids. Can we do that for large numbers of kids? Oh, one last thing, yeah. And uh, yeah, so would such an infrastructure help us get at optimizing pathing uh, through a library like that? Uh, so, Dr. Schilling, when you, when you said you wanted people to step outside of their comfort zones, I, I, we heard you loud and clear, so pow, moonshot. All right. Um, summative research, I think my colleague Sarah DeWitt covered that uh, in the Role for Evidence session yesterday, so I'm not going to spend the time. Uh, meeting the kid on their journey, uh, you know, diagnostic capabilities of the games play a role. Uh, we measure engagement, we think uh, it's really important, uh, so I think that plays a role in finding out where they are on their journey. Uh, we're starting, starting to try to get into social and emotional uh, learning related practices that affect problem solving uh, and, and learning, and if we can do that, why not other uh, compound measures? You know, can we get at something like the process of inquiry itself? I heard people talking today about doing just that. I'm fascinated, I want to learn as much as I can about that. Um, uh, and take what we've learned, uh, you know, and measure about learners and safely keep track of it over time. You know, have that knowledge map uh, of the content in that library. You know, what, what's been filled in adequately and what's missing and so forth. And how to provide the best learning space and support we can given a piece of content. You know, what I'm calling micro -adapti adaptivity inside the individual products in a library and macro -ad adaptivity across the, the, the library itself. Uh, I'm going to spend just a second on tools and then wrap up. Um, so infrastructure, it's a whole talk of its own, but this is Springroll. You can check it out at springroll.io. It's uh, uh, open sourced, it's on GitHub now. It's a game development library uh, uh, that, a, a, and a set of workflow tools and a set of publishing tools that start to get at all the problems that I, I just laid out. Um, so it's, a, it's for HTML5 game development and it has a specific focus on learning related games and a specific focus on accessibility. So, uh, so the library really was for um, 
you know, it was born of a desire to capture best practices across all the development that we're doing uh, and creating, you know, in creating multi-platform uh, educational learning games. And it solves pain points for developers. But the workflow tools make things like captioning super easy. Nobody has to create a captioning subsystem anymore. It's already done, and captioning can be done by an intern instead of everybody recreating the wheel. And the publishing setup is awesome. Every commit auto builds. Deployment is a click of a button. Rollback is a click of a button. It's, uh, it's really useful. I'd love to tell anybody Anybody who's interested in more about this, uh, but it, it winds up being not a win-win. It's a win-win-win-win-win-win-win-win uh, candidate. Sorry, let me wrap up. Um, so when you put it all together, you're looking at a production pipeline informed by formative testing and evidence-based decision-making in design. Uh, uh, what works clearing style, how summative, uh, access to existing robust set of distribution platforms and channels, uh, building learning content on a framework for competency assessment uh, for the earliest stages, and not just skill competency, but a framework that can start to get at m more foundational attributes uh, like grit, determination, resilience, and maybe even love of learning, if we can do that. Um, and who, you know, who else is doing this work? Are you, are you guys doing this work? I've seen so many pieces and nobody will ever have all the pieces and I, I don't have all the pieces. I only have a couple of the pieces, but I really want to get the exchange going. I, I, I love talking to people about this and imagine an R&D uh, platform for uh, breakthroughs in learning media and more properties and content and ways to reach people than almost any other outlet that might be available and uh, uh, as trusted a brand uh, as, as may, almost any other outlet. And I think that's big, I think it's really big. And I think there's a lot to learn about it. And I think we need to figure out how do we identify and describe what kids uh, need to know and be able to do and look comprehensively at that set of things uh, in terms of pre-academic preparation uh, and social and emotional development. So the goal would be to send our young people on towards where they need to be to succeed in, in school and life. So we don't know how good our approach is yet, uh, but what is more important than beginning to lay out that map and to debate about it? With that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you.